I graduated as a biochemist in 1969 and like a lot of biochemists in 1969 uh, I went into the computer industry. I'd done some computing as part of my biochemistry course and I was fortunate enough actually to be offered a, a short-term job by the university working in the university computer unit doing some research for them and while I was doing that research they offered me a job actually in the computer centre helping sort out the problem that the one computer that was providing a, a service to thousands of staff and students in the university uh, was actually crashing about mm, six or eight times a week um, and I took on the task of, of having the binary dump of the internal memory of this computer land on my desk and getting to the bottom of what had gone wrong and trying to make sure that we fixed it so that it didn't go wrong again. And in the, a couple of years we managed to get the uh, failure rate down to an acceptable level where it was, it was crashing you know, once every three or four weeks and that was much more tolerable because it wasn't interfering nearly so much with the way that, uh, that people wanted to use that computer. And the astonishing thing, looking back, of course, is that that was a two million pound computer in a vast room run by a, a large t team, several shifts of operators serving all these people. Uh, and, and these days I've got vastly more power and storage in my mobile phone and, and they give mobile phones away to sell you the airtime contract. And it is a phenomenal transformation that's occurred. I, I went from there, um, I, I worked in, in Delft for a while helping, helping write some key software for IBM um, on secondment from, from the university because they had a, a collaboration with a technical university in Delft and I went over to, to Delft to work on that. And I, I went from uh, working for University College to standard telephones and cables to, to work on the first generation of computer controlled PABXs, um, telephone switches, you know, in uh, office telephone switches. Uh, and then the University of Bath decided to, or, or all the universities in the southwest of England, decided to set up a regional computer centre on the campus at the University of Bath to serve all the universities providing the, the kind of computing power that they couldn't afford to have on each campus. And I moved down to Bath to help set up that new university uh, computing centre. And, and that was a real challenge because we were we had been given the latest largest computer by the uk's computer manufacturer icl an icl 2980 and it had almost no software so we asked the university users what software they really needed what programming languages they wanted to use for example and then we had the task of providing it and we had a small team of people so I set about finding other people who were users of those computers who also needed the same software that we needed and who were perhaps prepared to pay us to write it for them so that we got it free as well. And I ended up running a, a team of people as part of the Southwest University's Regional Computer Centre at the University of Bath that were funded on short-term contracts entirely by industry funding, writing the software that was needed actually by the users of the university. Uh, and then for university political reasons, some years later, I was told to shut down that operation because it was uh, a bit of a political embarrassment to the people leading other university computer centres in the country who were, I think, being asked why they weren't doing similar things. And so I moved a, a small group of people who had been working for me and whose jobs I had promised to preserve even though the, uh, their university contracts were short term, fixed term contracts. I moved them out into industry. I set up a, a company with a colleague called Praxis and we set out to be a software engineering company that would build 
computing systems that didn't fail for people who had applications that desperately needed computing systems that didn't fail. And we were very successful. We, we grew rapidly. We developed system software for ICL. We, we embedded the Unix operating system inside their operating system as a subsystem, for example, rewriting Unix in, in their own internal systems programming language, which was a, a variant of a wonderful language called Algol 68. Um, but we had, to, we had to do it preserving all the bugs in Unix because all the Unix software that was in the world depended on those bugs. So we, it, it was a, a wonderful challenge actually taking a, a piece of very elegant and very complex software but which had errors in it and, and uh, reproducing it in a way that meant that we kept, kept all the errors so that the, uh, all the utility software, for example, continued to work. I, I grew that company for a number of years and, and we, we got to 200 strong and we were faced with the decision. Did we want to remain as a, a niche company or did we want to attempt to have a bigger impact on software engineering around the world? And while we were pondering this, uh, Touche Ross, Deloitte and Touche un, under their original name, um, came and knocked on the door and said, would you like to become part of Deloitte and Touche, uh, and it looked like a good opportunity to really start to have the kind of investment and growth opportunities to do that. So we sold the company to, to Deloitte. I became a partner in Deloitte and Touche um, with responsibility for um, the software development activities for, for Deloitte's in, in the UK, and then later for um, advanced software engineering and, and all their year 2000 services internationally. Um, and after a few years in Deloitte's, I decided that working in a large organisation didn't suit me at all and I didn't like the culture in a big professional partnership like, like Deloitte's. And so I retired and resigned and walked away and went back to working for myself. Um, after that, I, I did firstly quite a lot of further year 2000 work. I, I was the, the ultimate safety net for national air traffic services, for example, um, monitoring all the and reviewing all the, the year 2000 remediation work that NATS did on all the systems that were supporting air traffic control in the UK. And also um, helping the board to look at the development of the Swanwick um, Control Centre, the, the new air traffic control centre that was being developed down on the south coast, which was running several years behind its original schedule and where the board and indeed the House of Commons Transport Select Committee were starting to get very anxious about whether it would ever be completed and if it was, whether it would be successful. So I, I reviewed that for the board and was able to reassure them that if they simply kept, kept the money flowing and kept their faith and um, encouraged the rest of the organisation to believe in it, it would actually be the success that it has in fact turned out to be. It's been, been a spectacular success in uh, improving the UK's ability to manage much higher traffic flows with, whilst preserving the extraordinary safety record of UK air traffic control. Uh, we, we've never had a, a collision in controlled airspace in the UK and I hope, hope we never shall. NATS is certainly an organisation that is committed to that. And I, I started taking on expert witness assignments, looking at what, would, what had gone wrong on projects that had failed and helping the participants and ultimately the courts to understand whose fault it was. So I've done a lot of work um, crawling over the entrails of major computing systems that have, have gone wrong in one way or another. And uh, it's, it's a fascinating business. It's a bit like a detective story. You, know, you, you read a project report one month and you scratch your head and you just say to yourself, no, no that, that's not going to work. And then you turn to the, the next month's project report or the one three months later and, and you see whether your predictions as to what would actually happen as a consequence of that turned out to be true. So it's, it's good fun, but it's, it's a challenge because you get so many documents to look at. 
one of the big projects I, I looked at, the development of a, uh, a major trading platform, electronic financial trading platform for an Australian bank. We had over three quarters of a million different documents that had been uh, uncovered, produced during the discovery process of, of that major litigation all of which had been indexed by the, the lawyers and were available in electronic form, and all of which I needed to have access to and to, to be able to pick the important ones from. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. It's so often the emails between the technical staff that tell you what's really going on on a project, rather than the reports from the, the project managers to the customer or, or to their own senior management. So that's, that was a a wonderful education in what um, software development is like in, in many major organisations. So I've, I've been very fortunate. I've, I've been able to look at an enormous range of IT projects. One of the great things about working in the IT industry is that you get behind the scenes of everybody else's business because you can't write software for a business if you don't understand the business. So it's, it's a way to really experience how the world works and to make a difference to it and, and to hope that you're making a positive difference to it. So my career has been very interesting in, in that way and I hope that I've learned some things from it that are applicable, generally applicable, some general truths that, that we can use in the way that we develop computing systems in the future and, and I'd like to share and discuss some of the insights that I believe I've gained through that process.